Welcome to the No BS Debates with our City Council candidates for District 3. Uh, we are your moderators. I'm Sarah Alley. And I'm Della Vaca. Uh, and we want to thank the candidates for being here tonight and coming out to represent their communities. We also want to thank the Denver Open Media and the Open Media Foundation and Civic Matters for hosting tonight's event. And lastly, we want to thank you, the audience, for participating in the democratic process. The debate rules are as follows. Uh, the moderators will ask individual questions uh, on the topic of civil rights and related issues. Candidates uh, queried will have one and a half minutes to respond, after which every other candidate can respond for one minute and the initial candidate can reply. Uh, we encourage lively debate, but if, we, uh, if somebody goes too long, we will interrupt. We'll cut you off. That's the plan. This debate is slated for 50 minutes, and as we draw into the last 10 minutes, we will go ahead and push into the lightning round. And that means that we will ask a series of rapid fire questions and you will answer in a concise fashion with a yes for or a no against. Uh, you may also pass if you choose to. Denver City Council District 3 is located in the historic west side, West Denver. Um, and it is home to the diverse Barnum, Barnum West, Lincoln Park, Marley, Sun Valley, Via Park, West Colfax, and Westwood neighborhoods. Candidates for District 3 are Veronica Elizabeth Barella, uh, Annie Martinez, Raymond Vontoya, and Jamie Torres. And today we have all of our candidates here, so thank you so much for being here. Let's go ahead and start with candidate introductions. We will begin with Ms. Barella. Hi, my name is Veronica Barella, and I'm candidate for District 3. I was born and raised in Lama Lincoln Park, which is this neighborhood here. Um, I worked in District 3 all my life. I uh, retired from a nonprofit housing developer called Newstead. Newstead was responsible for the revitalization of not only this neighborhood but Santa Fe Drive and ushered in the Art District. We also built the two shopping centers that are here in the neighborhood on Colfax and Calumet and Santa Fe Drive. It was the first retail use back in the community in 25 years. We also helped usher in the King Supers and also wrote the concept paper for the UDAG project, which was an answer to bringing back a middle income group that was displaced on the Auraria campus. We lost a third of our Latino community high home ownership. <clears throat> so my experience is in business development, housing, civil rights work, community organizing. I actually brought back the Cinco de Mayo uh, back to Santa Fe Drive years ago, it got so big we had to take it down to Civic Center Park. I was born in Lama Lincoln Park Projects to a mother uh, uh, that was on welfare, three siblings, went to all the schools here in the neighborhood, graduated from West High School. I have my master's in public administration from CU Denver. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I have this horrible cough. Um, I really, really love Denver, but I particularly love this neighborhood, the West Side, because this is where my heart and soul is. And that's why I work so hard to revitalize it. Thank you. Ms. Martinez. Hi there. My name is Annie Martinez, and I'm running to represent District 3 along with the other candidates here tonight. I am running because I believe that Denver is a city that can be prosperous for all, but we're failing our most disenfranchised communities. I am an attorney and I am an advocate in the community. I've been living here about five years now, and I'm just really excited to be supporting my people and amplifying their voice so that decisions that get made on city council actually reflect their best interests and not corporate best interests. Uh, mi nombre es Annie Martinez y estoy postulando para el Distrito 3 para representar la comunidad en el municipal. Uh, estoy corriendo porque creo que la comunidad latino específicamente no está suficiente representado en el municipal y en el gobierno. Y pienso que uh, como, una, ina, como una hija de inmigrantes y como una abogada, Tengo el poder y el esfuerzo para representar nuestra comunidad mejor y estoy pidiendo su boca. Gracias. Ms. Torres. Hi, everybody. Thanks for hosting the debate tonight. I'm Jamie Torres, and I'm also running for Denver City Council District 3. Um, it is the community that I'm born and raised in. It is also one that I've been working uh, for and on behalf of for the last 18 years, and it's been my honor. 
Um, I am born and raised out of Villa Park. And I think what I remember so vividly from my childhood was uh, where the childhood connections there. It was also where my grandparents bought their first home in the 1960s. And it is a community of opportunity, and that's how I still see it. Uh, there are a number of challenges. There are a number of um, complexities in Denver City Council District 3, and they're going to require somebody who both dives really deeply into what residents want and how to get it, uh, and who also really understands how city government uh, works, sometimes doesn't work, um, and how uh, you make things happen. I'm currently the Deputy Director of the Agency for Human Rights and Community Partnerships. It's an agency I've been in for 18 years, mm -hmm. and it's also where I established the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs in 2005. And since that time, really been will, uh, working to make sure that Denver is a welcoming place, uh, whether you are from international spaces or other states. Uh, Denver is a place where really you can build lives and put down roots. And I want to make sure that uh, District 3 uh, reinforces that and really demonstrates it brightly, brightly. And Mr. Montoya. Hi, thank you guys for hosting this <coughs> event. So my name is Raymond Montoya and I'm also a candidate for uh, District 3 here in West Denver. I currently uh, work for a school district as a bus driver, uh, getting to mentor kids, driving kids to and from school. It's um, a highlight of my, uh, of my day. I've called Denver home for the last 15 years and over the last 15 years I've seen West Denver uh, grow in some great ways and I've also seen uh, some negatives happen in our neighborhoods and I think that it's time for everyday people to be represented by everyday people. Uh, as cliche as it sounds, I mention it all the time that there are so many folks here in West Denver that don't have a seat at this political table and uh, they stay on that menu. I've been one of them, my neighbors, a lot of my community members and right now West Denver is at a historic low in voter turnout. We need to uh, get people excited again. We need to be able to have leaders that really listen and show that they care. It's the everyday person that's going to make that change. And so I hope to be that change for our community. Uh, I am currently studying to get uh, my degree in justice studies. I have also uh, studied to get to, I have my uh, business technology degree as well as uh, media communications. And I hope that that will help me uh, lead District 3. Uh, thank you, candidates. <laughs> At this point, we will jump into the main body of our questions. And as a reminder, the first person asked will have a minute and a half to reply. And every other candidate will have one minute to rebut or concur. Uh, the first question is on homelessness. Denver will be voting on Initiative 300, an initiative to allow any individual to engage in activities such as resting and sheltering oneself in a non-obstructive manner in an outdoor public place. <clears throat> the Right to Survive initiative is premised on protecting the homeless from city-mandated property seizures and a camping ban that leaves officers confiscating property year-long regardless of weather. This is a city-authorized police action which leaves the unhoused facing any number of adverse <coughs> health outcomes including and up to death and which also deprives them of personal property. Fear-mongering around Initiative 300 claims that permanent tent cities will pop up, which is not true. There were also claims that disease and waste will spread, which assumes the city can't mobilize public utilities and health agencies to help while longer-term solutions are organized. Do you support 300? If not, or if so, which other areas of our city resources should be mobilized to support our unhoused populations? We'll begin with Ms. Martinez. Well, I am a huge and ardent supporter of 300 from the jump. Um, I think that it's unlike what many people will say, actually very well written. And actually coming and giving a voice to the community that's going to be most affected by said ordinance, right? And I come, on it, come at it from a lot of different lenses. One, as an attorney and having represented a lot of our unhoused community at the jail when they've been ticketed for these exact types of citations. But I've also lived this life now in Denver. In the five years I've been here, I've been unhoused under this camping ban. I've slept in my car and been worried about, well, what's going to happen if a cop comes and tries to ticket me, or even worse, if I look a certain shade of brown that day, do I make it out alive, 
right? So I have plenty of reasons, personal and professionally, to be supporting 300 on top of morally. I definitely think it's the right thing to do, and I think that it's informed on the community's needs. And I mean, the way you prefaced the question kind of hit all the <laughs> points anyway that I would have made. The fear mongering surrounding it has been abysmal and like <coughs> abhorrent morally. The money going into Together Denver or whatever it is that's supporting the backlash, that's money that could have been much better spent on the community themselves. And on top of that, Denver just needs to do more public housing and more transitional housing. We have a surplus in the millions and yet we don't use it to actually bring forth solutions in this dire crisis. Thank you. Um, I uh, I agree with Annie. I you know, 1.5 million dollars to defeat this initiative is just ridiculous. Should be uh, spent on the homeless. The camping ban criminalizes the homeless, and it's just wrong. Um, the Ninth Circuit Court has found there in Boise, Idaho, they had a similar uh, initiative, and they found it. Um, you know, it violates their civil rights. It's cruel and un usual punishment. I, saw, I hope somebody here is filing a lawsuit against Denver's camping ban. That would go to the Tenth Circuit Court. Um, it, we've talked about that before. But what's going on with the homeless in the city is just wrong. The camping ban, I think, was instituted about seven years ago. And I think only two people, no, three people on city council voted against it. Um, if, if, I'm, if I'm lucky to get on city council, I will put forth an ordinance to, to remove the camping ban because it is cruel and unusual punishment, and I hope somebody files a lawsuit really quickly about it. Um, criminalizing people, homeless people, is just wrong, and we need to better house them. Putting up 11 tiny homes is not going to, is not, I mean, it's good, you know, it's a start, but it's not going to uh, uh, meet any of the solutions to help the homeless. They need housing, they need, uh, they need counseling, they need mental health help. They just need a lot of things and they're not getting it. Before anybody rebuts, I just want to bring up, I don't know if you all heard, the uh, Tiny Home Village found a new home in Globeville. Mm -hmm. It's being relocated, right. it's yeah. been fully approved. Mm -hmm. uh, that's actually very exciting, right. exciting for Denver, um, but also points to a need for bigger steps to continue we, with rebuttals. Yeah, we do need. I am supportive of 300. So it took a lot of um, going back and forth, talking to a lot of different folks uh, who are for 300 and who are against it. Uh, reading the language, it, uh, it really clarifies exactly what 300 will do. And it squashes, for those who are against it, if uh, it should squash uh, any misconceptions that it has. Um, I think that 300 is the right choice right now. We're criminalizing like everyone else on here so far has said, uh, our homeless population and it's just not right. We've had over 220 uh, homeless people die um, recently because of the urban camping ban and it's just, it's not okay. Um, we need to do better. They, the budget has really been cut on mental health services and the city has been utilizing uh, jails for their mental health services. And it's, it, we gotta do something, uh, we gotta find more permanent solutions rather than the temporary Band-Aid that's, that's, that's in effect right now. Uh, from, from my angle and both working in human rights but also having um, experienced poverty as a teenager when we lost our apartment. Um, what, what really elevated our family through that uh, was housing. Um, we were approved for Section 8 housing out of Littleton Housing Authority after a year of uh, being in couches and spare bedrooms um, with my mom and my sister. Um, and housing is what we need. I know that it's hard to come by. I'm not a supporter of 300, but largely because it, it in and of itself isn't a solution. Um, and I don't think the city has done a good enough job putting solutions forward. Um, what I do credit the supporters and the petition signers, I was one of them who actually put this on the ballot, um, was that it has forced a conversation for the city and actual action um, that now there's you know a new department and $15 million in funding uh, that's going to go toward uh, housing and homelessness solutions. Um, Denver's Road Home has long needed an overhaul and what it really needs to do is overhaul sheltering as well. Um, the tiny home village was a success. Uh, we need it in every single neighborhood and even the neighborhoods that don't want them. When you say housing is the solution and 300 isn't, 
what do we do for folks like Benjamin Harvey in Boulder that didn't make it to a shelter and trying to abide by the camping ordinances ended up dying on Christmas Day in the city of Boulder on the Bancho. Uh, when we take from the homeless the limited amount of insulation that they have from the elements and say, well, this isn't the solution. What is the solution today? Because housing is definitely the solution, but it's long term. It takes time. What is it? We have, <coughs> it's been reported that luxury apartments make up 88% of new apartments in Denver. Uh, homes averaging 5,000 square feet are taking up spaces that used to be 1,500. What's the solution for today? For today, it's reforming shelters. Right now, they're not 24 hours. Right now, they do not allow couples. Right now, they do not allow uh, service animals uh, or pets. Uh, right now, they do not, uh, they are not as opening to LGBTQ identifying individuals. Um, sheltering services need reform, and that was actually recommended by uh, the director of Denver's Road Home right now. It's also a complete shortage of beds. Even if they were to reform it, there's just not enough space for everybody. There Final is enough space. Final yeah, there's rebuttal about from a thousand Martinez. people that would be without beds, because there's about 2,000 beds with over almost 4,000 individuals unhoused. And on top of that, based on just what the ACLU has said, supporting 300, I just fundamentally can't understand how we wouldn't support something that gives back basic human rights to some of our most vulnerable communities. And that's what 300 does. And I just, I can't stand aside and not support something that gives back to individuals who need it so much. And they have nothing else but sometimes the blanket next to them. Not all of us are as lucky to have couches to crash on. Some of us have to crash on the street or in the car. And Right now, they can't do it. They are criminals for doing it. And this gives them back those basic human rights. And that's where I'm at with it. And right. I got to just throw in there, you mentioned housing and how many apartments are in the city. I've, you know, it may not seem like such a housing crisis so much as an affordability issue. We don't pay livable wages. You got so many people in this city who work 40 <clears throat> plus hours a week. Mr. Montoya, who, that's a great direction that you're headed. And I hope we get to it in the future questions. I think number two might be in that direction, but we have to move on because we're 15 minutes in. Perfect. Yes, yes. so the next question, um, racial equality and equity remain a nationwide concern. A few facts. Colorado had the most extensive KKK networks uh, west of the Mississippi through the 1930s. The grandson of one ran for governor this past year. One neighborhood and the airport are named after him. That is Stapleton. Education, educational equity has failed children of color based on zip code. Gentrification continues. According to the Denver Gentrification Study in 2016, our communities are viewed as potential profit margin rather than as community. The Colorado Trust tied historic segregation to modern gentrification. Addressing the racial wealth gap in Colorado, they said the latest view of racial and income inequality in the U.S. shows deep and entrenched disparities along racial lines. How does it play out in Colorado? Not well. Across a range of measures, Colorado is failing to provide equitable opportunities across racial lines. Colorado is third in the nation for white supremacist propaganda. White terrorists white, and right-wing violence are the biggest threat to Americans, yet people of color suffer the brunt of policing. What are your thoughts on racial equality and equity? How will you work to move District 3, and by extension Colorado, towards a more equal and equitable future? We'll start with Ms. Berea. <clears throat> I, uh, I have fought for civil rights my whole life. Uh, when I uh, started to uh, college in Greeley, Colorado, um, I picketed the American Nazi party that was up there talking about, you know, sending, you know, everybody back to, you know, Africa, Mexico, wherever it was, and finishing the Jews off and, and doing the Catholics. It was a scary situation. I've ever been in in my life, but I took a picket sign with the head of the <clears throat> political science department and there were seven of us students that picketed this man and I have fought for civil rights all my life. In fact, I started the Civil Rights Awards when I was at NUSET <clears throat> and they're going into their 29th year this year. Um, I have fought for civil rights back, um, you know, like I say, from college on, even when I was in high school. I suffered a lot of civil rights uh, infractions, 
But I think it's most important to remember about what NUSET has done over the years and what I've done. We started with redlining and Community Reinvestment Act, the HUMDA data, the, I, I co-chair the Colorado, uh, the Committee for City and Airport Fairness. We've, uh, in, we've increased the concessionaires, the MWEB programs, especially at DPS. I am a strong advocate for civil rights, and I walk my talk. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Montoya. So civil rights has been an issue uh, not only in our city and in our state, but in our country. I think that um, we need to start standing up, letting our voices be heard. And, you know, redlining has been such a detriment to our communities, especially here in West Denver. We, um, we live in a minority community where recently with the growth of our city, we're just getting more and more pushed out. Um, you know, I see this a lot too in our education and the disparity between education and colored uh, students. Our black and brown students in the school district that I work for are just being swept through the system. We're cheating them, we're not able to, we're failing our students in that education process just because of the zip code. A lot of the students suffer homelessness, a lot of them um, don't have the same advantages of other folks, of other students who live in a zip code that uh, is, you know, in a different neighborhood. So we really need to step up and and be a voice for, for civil rights. Ms. Torres, you had something. Sure. Um, this is such an important question uh, for me, but also for the city, because it's one that we failed to address for decades. Uh, my agency was created in 1947 with the sole purpose of assessing race relations in the city at the time. And this was under Mayor Quig Newton, who came right after Mayor Stapleton. And here we are 70 plus years later um, with uh, fewer answers than solutions when it comes to how we view race, power, and privilege in this city. Uh, because we are a liberal and progressive city, um, it also gives us some cover to not talk about things like those three issues uh, and the ways that they play out. And from a council seat, we've got to be willing to get into interpersonal oppression, systemic oppression, and institutional oppression and find the ways that we dismantle those, both from the inside out and the outside in. I think a big part of that, though, I agree with what you said, Jamie, but I think we have to go a level deeper in recognizing that that systemic oppression, that racist structure is tied in with capitalism and they feed off each other. And that capitalism is one of the biggest um, pushers of racist policies and that they reinforce one another. And that we can sit here and try to talk about our internal biases, but until we affect that structure and dismantle a lot of that, which like, uh, legitimizes the racist structure that we live in, I don't think we're gonna fix all the problems. And with all due respect, people who've been, you know, in the city, in this limelight for so long, the problem still continues. And so it's like, where, what has been going on these, all these years that um, people have dedicated their service to the city that the <clears throat> solutions haven't uh, came about. We're suffering more racism um, in this day and age in 2019, um, just as if it was in the past, we, it, we gotta do more. We gotta hold uh, people in those positions accountable, I think. Anti-defamation league has markedly looked at um, hate crimes and the increase since 2015, and it has gone from literally nine to over 50. Um, this isn't something that is just a, a matter of local. This is national situation that's increasing and allowing to levitate um, hate and uh, systems of oppression that were seedlings um, that have been, that have grown uh, in in both stature and I think dynamism throughout the country. Let's get a last word from Ms. Barella. Yes. I, I feel like you are the only one that really gave concrete examples Solution. of things that you've done right. to address racism. Mm -hmm. right. And we can talk about structures and the structure. Right. It, it's, it's a it's such a broad idea, mm -hmm. right? Like the average person doesn't even know how to address that. Mm -hmm. Systematic institutional races, racism is a huge problem. And you know, you can talk about it all you want, but if, if you don't do something about it, you know, addressing, for example, the Committee for City and Airport absolutely forced the Denver Public Schools to do a disparity study because on the bond issue, less than 1% of those funds were going out to black and brown contractors. Now, now get that, I'm saying less than 1%. You look at the population of black and browns in DPS. 
and and you know we couldn't we I mean we had to fight with Bosberg for several years to get him to do that disparity study we fight with the mayor I mean you know about hiring you know and 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 commissions and and those problems too out at the airport the concessions were down to 25 percent under Mayor Hickenlooper from 40 under Mayor Webb and we have gotten that back up to 44 percent and that's because we get in there and we we deal with the institutional racism we know how to deal with it I know how to deal with it and we find results when I'm through with it such a huge topic I appreciate your answers yeah, uh, thank you. I don't think we're gonna find a solution today for that <laughs> But that's, that's, for, that's for one of you. That's for one of you on council. Exactly. Question three. Uh, we'll start with uh, Ms. Torres. <clears throat> April. Uh, today is the last day of April. Yeah. Is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Mm -hmm. One in five women and one in 17 men in Colorado will experience an attempted or completed rape in their lifetime. These are the uh, only the ones that. These reflect only the ones who have reported the rape. Blue Bench. Uh, rape prevention program here in uh, Denver says that 60% of rapes go unreported. 42% of victims experienced their first completed rape before the age of 18. A 2016 survey found that 28% of CU Boulder's female undergrads had been sexually assaulted. In 2018, Denver DA Beth McCann prosecuted or was able to prosecute only 33% of rape cases, a small improvement over her predecessor's average of 30%. The Denver Post rape tracker shows that Denver has had 218 sexual assaults reported so far this year. That's up from 122 when we began this debate series a few weeks ago. It's an average of 56.2 a month in Denver. The average number of rapes per neighborhood this year in Denver is 2.79. The numbers are obviously staggering. How will you use your seat on the council to address these issues and make Colorado a safer place for women and female identified bodies? Uh, those statistics are horrifying and uh, true, and as uh, a woman who takes public transit um, and who has survived uh, sexual assault, um, it's horrifying that it hasn't gotten better. Um, I think for uh, women and women identified, um, but also men who are victims of sexual assault, um, I think knowing that only 33% of uh, charges that do come forward of the 40% that are reported um, uh, are actually seen through in charges is demoralizing and that wouldn't encourage me to uh, uh, come forward even if I was to be relieved. And I think uh, there are so many things that count against folks who report this um, uh, that, it, that it feeds that animal in and of itself. Um, there are a number of things that I think a city council person can do, uh, both in a position of leadership, um, but also of, of, of shepherding conversation is uh, to elevate this beyond just what women can do to make themselves safe and report, uh, but also what we expect of men and of other community members to speak up and to believe women and victims and survivors. Um, all of this, I think, requires culture change and our ability to have courageous conversations about this, uh, give people safe spaces to report it, um, and dive deeply into communities that are afraid to do that. As the director of the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, that's exactly one of the things that we help do. <coughs> open it up I mean I think a big issue though is people don't open up and report because there's no consequence mm -hmm. when our mayor gets away with you know certain comments of harassment it's gonna embolden other people when we've got our president who's been elected who behaved the way he has behaved it emboldens people and you know the DA's office has no problem persecuting black and brown people for like crimes that are not actually harming anyone in crimes of either economic nature or maybe of others that don't actually involve force there's plenty of time to prosecute those but yet we can only do 33 mm percent -hmm. like that's an abysmal number it's because the desire isn't there and the desire isn't there because the police don't care because they don't believe it and they're not doing the right type of investigation with it and then it doesn't rise to the level of any prosecutor prosecuting it because they don't want to. They don't buy into it. So it's great to have the conversations to say we're going to believe victims. But, you know, that's again, it comes off kind of patronizing. Like, yeah, I'll believe you, but I'm not going to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. You know, and until people feel that there's consequences for these actions, those numbers won't get any better. I know so many women that have been um, sexually abused. And I really think that the Me Too movement has been really helpful in this country to bring much of this to light. Um, 
if if I was a young girl and in, in, in college and stuff, I'd go take some karate lessons or some some self defense lessons. I think that's really important. I mean that you know um, you can defend yourself, and I think I think these women that are in school or or you know walking somewhere at night or even during the day, they need to learn to defend themselves. I think that's really important. But the Me Too movement has brought this to light and it has spread across the country. And I think that one of the biggest problems with somebody that's been uh, raped uh, or sexually abused is, is they need to report it and they're afraid to report it. And we need to change that culture. We need to change that culture within the police department, within the medical profession, and as the city council person, I will help with that. So it, I agree with all of the opponents up here. It's a disgusting number and it's horrifying. Uh, I come across a story recently about a school employee up in New York who took a 14-year-old student and raped her in his home. And it explained he pled guilty to the charge and was sentenced to 10 years probation and no jail time. So people are afraid that nothing's gonna happen to a perpetrator, um, and especially when our leaders are getting away with it, like Ms. Martinez has mentioned, it's just disgusting. Um, as Jamie had mentioned, a person in a leadership position uh, can help empower women. We need to start teaching empathy to our children, um, kindness and compassion. I think it starts at an early age, and as a leader, we need to lead by example and start doing that um, on all levels of our constituency, in our neighborhoods, in our communities. So, uh, Ms. Torres brought up safe spaces, cultural change. Um, Ms. Barala brought up the Me Too movement. Uh, Ms. Martinez brought up some, a lot of pointed uh, arguments about the mayor and the president, which some would argue are fair. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if there's any targeted ideas for how we can address the issues. When we talk about the police not caring and their investigations not rising to the level of prosecutorial uh, you know, evidentiary standards for Beth McCann, is Beth McCann failing as DA or is it the police? Where's the breakdown? And no, the city council does not have power over the DA, right? But what kind of pressures can be leveled, right? And what other things can be done, right? If we have a mayor, that uh, they had to actually change a law in Colorado to <coughs> make future mayors and other city employees accountable because he wasn't before, which is why he couldn't be prosecuted. How do we, what are the <coughs> steps going forward? Because I haven't heard a lot of change ideas. Actual solutions. One of the things that, um, the very first board that I was a part of was uh, the Denver Center for Crime Victims, which is now the Trauma and Resilience Center. And in the absence of uh, faith and confidence in law enforcement, and judicial system, people are going to nonprofits. They're going to, to faith institutions. They're going to places where they can trust somebody with their story and to guide them because the system um, further victimizes them uh, by telling them to tell their story over and over again by offering them no relief <coughs> and no recompense. So um, there's a, a certain level of engagement and support of our nonprofit structure that directly serves victims of crime. I went to a conference where um, we got to tour a courthouse that had a uh, adjacent victims right, um, it was like a house for them and that's where they went when they had to prepare to testify, when they had to meet with investigators, when they had to meet with prosecutors and it was a home, there was a normal kitchen, they had a couch and it was a very opening space and it was also a space that housed kind of 24-7 crisis uh, so like social workers that people could go and outcry to. And that was a deliberate effort by that uh, district court to support victims more and give them a safer space to come out to versus a cold police room or something. But I think what we can remember, I think we're all kind of dancing around this point, is that as a city council person, you have a platform, and with that platform comes an obligation to take a stand and say certain things, even if directly you don't get to vote or make something out of it. And when you use that platform for the betterment of your community, you can nag the DA's office and say, why are we at 33%? You can come out to DPS and say, you need more consent training at the schools. You can tell the sheriff's department and the police department, you need better training on these issues. So using that and leveraging that power is important. Wrapping up that topic, we have to move on to the next question. Uh, the consent point is well taken. Uh, consent education was debated 
uh, in our state house. Mm-hmm. And does anybody know, did it pass? I can, did I they know. make, because what they're trying to do is make consent education mandatory at schools that teach sex ed, but sex ed isn't even mandatory. Yep. So as council people, that's probably one thing that you could help with. Yep. Even in Denver, make consent mandatory in every school because you're right that it starts young. It starts mm-hmm. with teaching compassion and kindness. It starts with teaching consent specifically to boys. Absolutely. Yeah. And now let's move on to question four. According to denverpublichealth.org city council district report for district three, there's a few facts here. District three life expectancy is 76.1 years. That's 2.5 years shorter than Denver overall, which is at 78.6. Differences in life expectancy, expect, uh, expectancy Skip that word. <laughs> between districts show that place actually matters. Um, 18% of District 3 young adults um, ages 18 through 24 use tobacco 1% higher than Denver overall, which is at 17%. 20%, 21% of public school children uh, years 2 to 17 um, in District 3 neighborhoods are obese, 5% higher than Denver overall, which is at <coughs> 16%. Twelve percent of District 3 adults have been diagnosed with depression, which is which is common across all districts in Denver at 13%. Denver.gov states that the health of a community depends on more than access to health care. Healthy communities are composed of our physical environment, healthy op- opportunities, support, and where individuals easily connect with community partners, healthy food systems, and safe environments. Increased access to these items allows individuals of a healthy community to thrive. Do you believe District 3 is serving its community equitably in these areas? And if not, what are you going to do to address the disparities that are in your district? We'll start with you, Mr. Raymond. So I don't think that... (laughs) Mr. Montoya. (laughs) My students call me that. It's fine. They're fine. Uh, So, you know, I, I do think that we are doing a little more than what we were doing before. I don't think that... We were serving our community or our uh, members of the community um, as we should. Um, you know, Denver Health is starting to revamp. We've built some other medical centers, but uh, rec centers have started to go up. Um, there's been a lot of talk and debate about um, the need for you know our youth to do things, um, but it's hard uh, when it comes to being able to afford to go and do things, especially here. You have a lot of folks that. Um, are working two or three jobs or in a single family home and they can't afford to get their kids out to enjoy some of these uh, these activities that the city can offer. Uh, you know what I think is unfortunate is um, that West Denver doesn't have, a lot of the neighborhoods aren't as safe as what we'd like. It's uh, a lot of people have told me that they don't like to go out um, you know, walking around at a, after dark in certain areas, um, and I can see why we have gunshots that go off here and there, and it's become kind of a normalty. And so, I think that uh, a lot of our youth who are experiencing such um, dire needs to go and get a healthy relationship with their rec centers or in their community or at their parks are afraid to do so because of the public safety issues. Um, I think we need to do better in serving our communities in this way. One of the big problems in District 3 is <clears throat> it's, uh, you know, most of it's a food desert, and, uh, and, and that's a huge problem. There's a couple of co-ops in District 3 um, and, and a little store, but the only major grocery store is, um, is right off of Belmar and here in this neighborhood on Santa Fe Drive, King Supers, and what happens uh, to people, um, and, and I also want to say that they need to teach nutrition to our students in high school about, about you know, what, what's good for them and what's bad for them, but people need to have access to fresh fruits and vegetables and fresh food. And, and you know, when you have a food desert, they don't. And so what they do is they go to convenience stores and eat processed food, which is deadly for people. And, and you're right, the smoking is, is a huge problem. And, and, the, and, the, and the alcoholism and the drug use. So we've got some serious problems that need to be solved that uh, are not, well, it seems insurmountable, but it isn't. Thank you. 
Uh, for me, my background, um, I'm actually an anthropologist. Um, my, med my master's degree is in <coughs> medical anthropology. And ultimately what District 3 has faced is what a lot of uh, communities experiencing poverty face. Um, and that's not just access to things, but also the stressor of being poor. Um, that has a direct result on public health. And I don't think that that has factored into our conversation of how we manage public health um, as often as it should. Um, when, you're, when you can't even think about um, where you're gonna be, where you're gonna get food, um, if, you're gonna, if your job is gonna pay you enough to, um, to feed your family, all of those things matter directly on public health. Um, but it's also a matter of um, also looking at District 3 as um, I feel like the district has risen to try to solve its own problems in the absence of um, absolute inequity from the city. I would have jumped in, but Jamie said everything I was going to say. <laughs> Great. So, you know, there we go. <laughs> so did you want to concur? I will concur. Yeah, if we're not dealing with the stresses of just waking up and being alive that day, it's a lot it's too hard to worry about what you're putting on your plate right now. So until we're addressing a lot of that inec you know, inequality, people worrying about a salad, it's not gonna be high on their list. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Should we leave it there? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Final question. <laughs> Final question of the major questions. Um, actually, I had a follow-up question on health. Mm -hmm. How about that? Ooh. All right, uh, this is on human health and environmental justice. Knowing that the people who live within a thousand feet of highways have higher rates of cancer, heart disease, and cancer, and that those exposed to contamination from the Vasquez I-70 Superfund side have experienced multi-generational effects of endocrine, disrupting chemicals that include birth defects, there's a, lot of, there's a long list of things, we'll assume you know a lot of this stuff is bad. Uh, would you choose a different alternative to the I-70 situation? How do we address traffic and transportation in our communities? Uh, when we're routing big trucks through neighborhoods that are idling around construction sites, there's development all over the place. Um, that topic. Um, I have always opposed I-70. I co-chair the Colorado Latino Forum, and uh, my campaign director, Ian, is uh, on the Colorado Latino Forum, and we joined the lawsuit with the Sierra Club on the I-70 issue, uh, and we did win a settlement, um, but it it, it, you know, we tried to stop the I-70 project. Um, <clears throat> those people over there have suffered so much with the ASARCO. They're, uh, you know, women have higher rates of cancer over there. There's higher rates of asthma. And now, what's it going to be like when they start that project? It's going to be devastating. Mm -hmm. And you see, you can see bits of that all over Denver. Um, in this neighborhood alone, on the other side of Osage, all that area was contaminated. The ice house was so contaminated that when the Rary campus built the athletic fields, which I helped them with that, um, <clears throat> they, they can't build buildings on there because it's so contaminated. You know, who knows how long it lasts, millions of years. Um, same with the Burnham Yards. The, this whole area over here is really contaminated and it impacts the health of this neighborhood. And, and before we leave it with those people in that community, um, it's important to understand that pollution travels. Yes. with transboundary pollution. What's Ooh, happening in District 9, it's happening here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I live on uh, the Boulder County side of my city, and there's Weld County, and Weld County has some of the worst air pollution yep. because of all the mm -hmm. oil fields. I guarantee you I'm breathing that. Yeah. So it's, it's not a, a mm -hmm. problem for another community, even though some of the industries might be located in different areas. There's not right? like boundaries in the sky that magically <laughs> keep particles away from you breathing them in as much as we might. As much as the wealthy might think that's what happens in Cherry Creek, you're still going to breathe it eventually. I mean, we have to get down to the point that it's a civil <clears> rights <throat> issue and it was a race-based issue. I'm totally against the expansion of I-70. They should be looking at rerouting it. And we should not be looking in this century, in this day and age, with the, the crisis of global warming and everything else, to be adding more pollution. We should be looking at multimodal transportation. We should be looking at becoming carbon neutral, not expanding a highway. It's just antithetical to common sense. Thank you. And we're running low on time because I was having fun. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's, let's go on to the next question on local media. Uh, this is a topic near our hearts, obviously. Uh, I run a magazine in Boulder County. Uh, everyone here is a professional and uh, working to be professionals. Media is in crisis in Colorado, right? Denver Open Media, our host today, this location uh, is being defunded. 
much of the equipment has been removed. Uh, the Denver Post and the Daily Camera are two major papers of record for the region, uh, are owned by hedge funds who are busy extracting capital and laying off staff, <laughs> right? Staff mm -hmm. from the Denver Post actually started a new newspaper called the Colorado Sun and got a grant to operate for two years. Uh, fake news is the slur of the day. Thanks to our president, uh, how do we support, how does the council support uh, local newspapers, community journalism, and organizations like Denver Open Media that work to be a pillar of community information and provide equal access, educational programs, and media training to our communities, uh, especially since we have so little media that isn't corporate controlled. Mm -hmm. Final question, we'll start with Ms. Torres. Sure. Um, this, uh, this hits incredibly close to home because my husband is a photojournalist who used to work for the Rocky Mountain News uh, that is no longer. And it was a different Denver when we had uh, two newspapers competing for story, for investigation, uh, for coverage, uh, and for in-depth uh, uh, reporting. And um, I remember my mom, as a single mom, reading the Rocky Mountain News every single day looking for tips on what to do with her daughters, where to send them, what kinds of opportunities were available, tips on parenting, every, you name it. Um, she was looking through the Rocky Mountain News and newspapers for that. Um, so we've lost a lot. Uh, and I think it's incumbent both as individuals. Um, you know, I am paying for digital subscriptions to multiple newspapers. Um, we've got to be supporting good news and community news. Um, I know the auditor did um, a, a, an assessment of Denver Media Services, including the Denver, um, the, the Denver Open Media um, contract um, that needs to be assessed. And from a council position, we've got to be able to ask questions of why certain decisions were made, because I don't think it was the fault of Denver Open Media or the foundation. Um, it was more of the management. And we need to be better about that, because we know that we are better informed um, and we operate better when we have uh, a news providing a, a grounding, I think, for um, uh, for what's going on in the community when we don't have new newspapers that are providing it uh, as in-depth as they used to. Before we have any uh, rebuttals, there's some more context to that, to my question that, that's important. Yeah, let's explore this a little bit further. So rather than renew support for public access media in 2018, uh, Denver's Department of Marketing and Media Services under Mayor Hancock removed control of Denver's three public access television stations to the city, resulting in the city co-opting control of the media and content from the public. Uh, government control of the only public TV forum for free expression and dissent compromises our First Amendment rights of the of the people. Um, access to equipment, facilities, and classes by the public has been greatly diminished since the city has removed much of the video broadcast equipment from Denver Open Media. Uh, the question here is, is mayoral control of public access media another example of power outreach by the mayor's office? Power overreach. Overreach. Yes, yes. yes. absolutely. I mean, yeah. All together now. Yeah. 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 In unison, <laughs> thank you. But as council people, right? It's a problem, how do we address it? Yes. We need to start uh, shifting some of that mayoral, that, the, mayor, the mayor's office has so much power that city council is kind of mute unless you have seven of the you know 13 votes. But I think that we need to work on transferring some of that power back to city council. Um, by doing that, I think we can alleviate some of the problems that we're seeing, like the one you just mentioned, Sarah. But I think that uh, the mayor has a lot of power that is overreached in many aspects, including the topic you just brought up in the media. This, this horse trading that goes on, you know, in the mayor's office mm -hmm. that nobody knows about, uh, and, then, and then this happens to the open media. I, we were here the day that they were told that uh, they were going to lose, lose open media and their equipment was going to go. You know, I, I agree with Raymond that some of that power in the mayor's office um, needs, needs to be transferred over to city council. Mm -hmm. That's it, it, too powerful and what you get is, for example, you get like there's four consulting firms that get hundreds of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars. They consult for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so what about all the other consultants out there that would like some work in this city? Mm -hmm. And they don't get it because, you know, the mayor controls everything. And so, <clears throat> you know, um, you, 
I won't get started on that. Cause <laughs> 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 all right, one last <laughs> response on the topic yeah. from Ms. Martinez. So, yeah. I guess I have a few points that kind of all tie into that. One would be a charter change that would not only change the exactly. power yeah. constructs yeah. between the mayor's mm -hmm. office and city council, but would also allow for a public bank in Denver because a public bank yes. could finance a lot of this uh, open media that, that needs support, exactly. right? Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is that right now, city council, while Ray said is sometimes they, are, they do have their hands tied behind their back, they're not as weak as they like to think. Mm -hmm. And if they stood up to the mayor more and said, we're not gonna approve exactly. this unless we do this, and manhandle them a little more, for lack of a better word, maybe we'd get somewhere. And then on top of that, I just find it ironic that as a socialist, I get told all the time, you want to make Denver Cuba, and yet we're a city where our mayor's office controls our alleged media. So I mean, we're really worried about socialism. I don't know, I think we're already there, I guess. <laughs> Ms. Martinez's plan is to strong arm the strong mayor that we have. Or strong I, I'm, claw. I'm not uh, opposed to the idea. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it is time to move into our final 10 minutes, lightning round followed by outros. Yeah, so accepting and understanding that these are complex issues um, and that we can debate the nuance of each topic, what we're asking for in general here is yes or no um, if you're for or against this, these questions, okay? All right, so to start. Go ahead. All right. Denver unveiled a new transportation proposal for a city department to supplement RTD's regional efforts. Are you for or against? For. 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 Denver is home to the nation's most polluted zip code. Transition Denver to fully renewables by 2030 or sooner, yes or no? Yes. Or sooner. Yes. Absolutely, yes. Denver is voting on decriminalizing mushrooms, the psilocybin initiative. De uh, decriminalize mushrooms, yes or no? No. No. Yes. Yes. Uh, importantly, plug, they're having the world premiere of the movie Dosed mm -hmm. in collaboration with uh, Decriminalize Denver tomorrow night mm -hmm. at Landmark Mayan Theater, 7 mm -hmm. p.m. Tickets available on Eventbrite. I just, I support movies. Plug. <laughs> <laughs> I used to work at Blockbuster at the thing. That was, that was, smooth. That was smooth. My first job. State representative, <laughs> State representative Julie Gonzalez has proposed removing the ban against rent and control to allow cities to decide for themselves what works best to support lower income renters. If the ban removal passes or passes in the future, would you support rent control in Denver, yes or no? Yes. Oh yeah. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Do you support deferred action for children arrivals DACA, yes or no? Yes. 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 The Olympics initiative prohibiting the use of public monies, resources, or fiscal guarantees in connection with any future Olympic Games without the city first obtaining voter approval for or against? Yes. Support. Yep. Support. I support it. April 10th was Equal Pay Day. The Equal Pay for Equal Work Act was recently heard in committee. Do you support a law to ensure equal pay, yes or no? Absolutely, yes. 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 Oh, that's good. <laughs> and together. <laughs> Accepting that constitutions can be changed, should we ban fracking in Colorado, yes or no? Yes. Yes. No. Oh. Yes. Oh, gosh. Now this question, prepare yourself. Ooh. Chocolate or vanilla? Ooh. <laughs> vanilla. Swirl. Swirl. Uh, uh, caramel. <laughs> Ooh. Get out. <laughs> I'm Chocolate. Chocolate. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And finally, for all the people that watch TV in the room, ending on some important geopolitical intrigue, who's going to win the Game of Thrones? Oh, God, I didn't watch it. Uh, <laughs> Arya. Uh, Ar Daenerys. Khaleesi. AKA. It's not the of dragons. Team Arya. Shank, shank. But I love dragons. I <laughs> ladies, and, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, candidates of District 3, thank you so much for being here. Mr. Montoya, Ms. Torres, Ms. Martinez, and Ms. Barella. Thank you so Good much. luck in your races. <clears throat> uh, if you haven't voted at home, ballots are available. They're probably in your mailbox. They're due by May 7th. Uh, too late to mail them, though. It's too late to mail them. Yeah. Make sure you drop <laughs> them off. Hand them to somebody just to make sure. Make sure you vote. You get the democracy you vote for or don't vote for. Uh, on behalf of Denver Open Media, the Open Media Foundation, and Civic Matters, my name is De La Vaca. And I'm Sarah Alley. Go vote.